Chapter thirty one of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Brea. Chapter thirty one Social Improvement. Were there but a single individual in the wide world, that individual with the laws that woman now has to guide her, laws internal and external, natural and revealed, would be susceptible of endless and illimitable improvement she might make advances every day and it would be her duty to do so upward towards the throne of god and towards the perfection of him who occupies it but if much might be done by an individual in a solitary state how much more may be accomplished in the social state in which it has pleased our heavenly father to place us it is difficult to turn our eyes in any direction without being met by numerous and striking proofs of divine wisdom and benevolence. But, if there be any one thing in the whole moral world short of the redemption by Jesus Christ, which overwhelms me with wonder and leads me to adore more than anything else, it is the divine wisdom and benevolence as manifested in the social state allotted to man. How interesting, how exceedingly so, the relation between a mother and a daughter and how many blessings deficient as many mothers are in knowledge and love are showered upon the head of a young woman through maternal instrumentality in no case however is this relation more interesting than when the young woman is just beginning to act for herself then if ever should she avail herself of them she knows little of the world before her either of the dangers on the one hand or the advantages on the other of these however the mother knows much that the daughter value her society and good counsel above all else human and lay hold of it as for her life how interesting too the relation between a wise and good father and a virtuous and affectionate daughter i am most struck however with this relation and most reminded of the divine goodness in its institution when I see a daughter ministered to the wants, moral and physical, of a very aged relative, parent or grandparent, one who is superannuated or sick, there are in civilized society, and above all, with the rays of the blessed gospel of the Son of God has been let in, scenes on which angels themselves might delight to gaze, and on which I have no doubt they do gaze with the most intense delight. Would that such scenes were still more frequent, would that filial love was always what it should be instead of degenerating into cold formalities how i have been charmed says addison to see whether the most beauteous woman the age has produced kneeling to put on an old man's slipper and so have i it is a sight which revives one's hopes of fallen nature no matter if the infirmities of the parent are the consequences of his own folly vice and crime the same soft hand is still employed day after day and the same countenance is lighted up with a smile being able thus to employ it but when the tenderest love on the part of a young woman in this relation and to the kindest efforts to promote the temporal happiness and comfort of those whom she holds dear is joined a love for the mind and soul when every opportunity is laid hold of with eagerness to inform to improve and elevate and this too though the subject of her labour is the most miserable wreck of humanity of which we can conceive when to works of love are added the warmest prayers at the bedside and elsewhere for almighty aid and favour the interest of the scene is indescribable it needs a more than mortal pen or pencil to portray it there are other relations of society relations of the young woman i mean in particular which are of great importance and interest among these are the relations of brother and sister perhaps i am inclined to make too much of the passage of scripture already noticed in another chapter where cain is said to have been set over abel in the very language which is used to signify the superiority of adam over eve and yet it must mean something there is a mutual dependence between brothers and sisters of every age which should result in continual improvement intellectual moral and religious the duties involved in this relation however will be more especially binding on elder brothers and sisters 
and, as it appears to me, above all on elder sisters. Indeed, in this respect it is impossible for me to be mistaken. An elder sister is a sort of second mother, and she often fulfils the place of a mother. Oh, how important, how sacred, the trust committed to her keeping. I have seen the care of a large family devolved by the death of the mother upon the elder daughter, instead of her being disheartened at all, I have known her to go forward in the pathway of duty, sensible at the same time of her dependence on her heavenly father, and not only instruct the other children, but train them up in the same degree in the way they should go. Do you think I respected or loved this young woman the less because she was thus early a housekeeper, a matron, and a mother? Do you think I esteemed her the less because, exclusive of the common school, she had no seminary of instruction? Her education was a thousand times more valuable than that of the fashionable routine of the schools without the kind of discipline she had. A world whose females were all educated in the family schools, and especially in the school of affliction and poverty and hardship, would be incomparably a better world than one whose young women should wear soft clothing and live in king's courts, who should be educated by merely fashionable mothers, amid ease and abundance, and finished at the institute or the boarding school. Let me not be understood in all this as undervaluing kind mothers and boarding schools and comforts and luxuries even in themselves considered. All I mean to discourage is a reliance on them, to the exclusion of other things of more importance. If we could have the latter in the first place, difficulties, hardships, hard labour and adversities, and upon these engraft the former, I should like it exceedingly well. What I dislike is not ornament in itself, but ornament on that which is not worth ornamenting, and above all, nothing but ornament. Let every young woman whose eye meets these paragraphs rejoice if she has younger brothers or sisters, or even if she has brothers or sisters at all. The younger may do something for the older as well as the older much for the younger, and if she is without either, there are probably other and remoter relatives for whom something may be done. I have alluded elsewhere to grandparents. There are usually uncles, aunts, and cousins, sometimes in great numbers. There is much due to these. I know very well that our over-refinement in an over-refined and diseased society says otherwise of late, and that our time is expended more and more, especially that of females, and our own dear selves to the exclusion of remoter relatives. But this should not be the case. Whether we have brethren or sisters, properly so called, together with other more distant relatives or not, we have brethren and sisters. The world is but a great family, and all are brethren, or ought to be so. We should love all, even our enemies, as brethren, but we should love with the deepest and most enduring affection those who love God most ardently. My mother and brethren are they that hear the word and do it, said the Saviour, and it is only in proportion as we possess his spirit that we shall be found to belong in the truest sense, to his family. The ties of which I have been speaking in the preceding paragraphs will have but poorly answered their purpose if they have not had the effect to raise us to this universal love referred to by the Saviour. For this they were chiefly instituted, and to this, in the best state of human society, do they tend. They do not lead us to love relations usually so called any less, Neither did they have this effect on Jesus, but they lead us to love the world at large more. If young women would have the spirit of our Lord and Saviour, or if there would be instruments in his hands of hastening the glad day of his more complete reign on the earth in the hearts of his intelligent family, they must strive to come up to this love of the human family. It is to elevate them to this love, I again say, that the family institution, with all the interesting relations which go out of it, was instituted. When it has accomplished this work, though, it will not cease to be valuable in the abstract, 
will be less valuable relatively because it will absorb a smaller proportion of our thoughts and affections and leave a large proportion for the world in general and its creator i have quoted elsewhere the sentiments of addison in regard to the filial affection of daughters in the same paper this interesting writer embodies his views on this subject in the character of a young woman by the name of fidelia whose devotion to her father he describes as follows quote, fidelia is now in the twenty-third year of her age but the application of many admirers and her quick sense of all that is truly elegant and noble in the enjoyment of a plentiful fortune are not able to draw her from the side of her good old father when she was asked by a friend of her deceased mother to admit the courtship of her son she answered that she had a great respect and gratitude for her for the overture in behalf of one so near to her but during her father's life she would not admit into her heart no value for anything which should interfere with her endeavours to make his remains of life as happy and easy as could be expected in his circumstances the happy father has her declaration that she will not marry during his life and the pleasure of seeing that resolution not uneasy to her End quote. now though i am not quite satisfied with the selfishness of the father in this case nor with the notion of fidelia that the particular friendship of another would interfere materially with her filial duties yet i do not undertake to say that there are no cases in which a young woman has the right the moral right to make resolutions not unlike that made by fidelia it does not seem that her resolution to neglect the society of others for the sake of discharging an important filial duty was for a longer period than during the short life of a decrepit old father i have introduced this subject in this place as a preface to a series of remarks on that particular relation which every young woman except perhaps a few who are situated like fidelia ought to be prepared to sustain and to sustain well indeed i consider this to be paramount at a suitable age to every other and that no duty can as a general rule be more obligatory he who instituted the law of marriage has not yet condescended to say how early or in what circumstances this command must be yielded to or obeyed but as a general rule he expects it to be obeyed in some form or other and at some time or other or to express the views i entertain more correctly i should say that no young woman in ordinary circumstances has the right to resolve to neglect the subject for ever or to say she will never marry she is to consider the command of the creator as obligatory as a general fact on the whole human race she must remember moreover that if it is binding on the whole it must be so on the individuals composing that whole on these principles the education of every young woman should as i think be conducted and if by the neglect of parents masters or guardians it has not been so then it should be the aim of the young woman herself in her efforts at self-education to supply what has been by others omitted some of the items in this work of education have been alluded to not only in the chapter on domestic concerns and in that on economy but elsewhere my purpose at the present time is merely to speak of the selection of a society with reference to a future state of life this is a subject of the highest importance to the happiness present and future of every young woman the marriage relation considered only as a means of completing the education of the parties is one of immense importance but it is of still greater importance in reference to other duties which it involves hence it requires much forethought and reflection let me prevail with you therefore when i urge upon you the following considerations one never think for one moment of the society of any other than a good man whatever may be his intrinsic endowments wit beauty talent rank property or prospects all should be as nothing to you unless his character is what it should be of course i am not encouraging you to look for angelic perfection or purity on this earth 
but do not make too many allowances, on the other hand, for frailty. A close examination, as with the microscope, will disclose irregularity and roughness on the most polished or smooth surface. How then will that surface appear which is uneven without the microscope? If it were possible for your associate for life to come apparently near celestial purity and excellence, a closer acquaintance would most undoubtedly convince you that he was of terrestrial origin. Do the best you can, therefore, and you will do ill enough. 2. It is not sufficient, however, that the friend you seek should be good, that is, negatively so. He must do good. Multitudes in these days pass for good men because they do no harm, or because at most they maintain a good standing and are benevolent in the eye of the world. I know of more than one person in the world who gives his property by thousands annually, and whose praise is in all the churches, who never yet gave anything worth naming in his life, if the gospel rule on the subject is to be the correct one, that the widow who of her penury casts into the treasury two mites, in reality casts in more than all they, of their abundance, bestowed large and liberal sums. Let your associate, therefore, be a doer of good, in deed and in truth. This is said, however, with the supposition that you are so yourself. For, if I have not already convinced you that the great end for which you are sent into the world is to do good, I shall not expect to do so by any remarks which could be thrown in here. If you are still out of the way, it is to be feared you will remain so, nor shall I expect you, for reasons to be seen presently, to seek the society of those who do not possess the same turn of mind. 3. It is highly desirable that the individual with whom you associate for life should be something more than merely a good man. This, however, does not explain my meaning, for are there not many of the most excellent persons in the world whom you would not willingly take for a daily companion? Do you not desire likeness in opinion, taste, purpose, etc.? Might not the two very best persons in the world be unhappy in each other's constant society if they were exceedingly unlike each other? In the establishment, then, of this interesting relation, seek by all means an individual who appears to entertain views of social life as much as possible like your own. Does he find his happiness in going abroad or in lounging? Is he impatient in the society of children? Is he a great friend of parade and excitement? And do you the reverse of all this? Do you love most the quiet and retirement of home, and to be surrounded by infancy and childhood? Do you dread, above almost all things in the world, excitement and parade? Does your friend hate nothing so much as his own thoughts and reflections? Does he dread also, like the cholera or the plague, all efforts at mental or moral improvement? Does he hate improving conversation, and above all, those books and associates which have the improvement and elevation of the body and spirit, for their great and leading object? And have you a different taste, entirely so? Do you live, do you eat, drink, sleep, wake, exercise, dress, labour, play, converse, read and think, and pray you may become wiser and better and holier. In short, is the ultimate object of the one the gratification of self, and does all with him terminate in the external, while the other seeks primarily in all things the improvement, the holiness and the happiness of herself and others? How can such persons be suitable companions for each other? Can two walk together, says the scripture, unless they are agreed? that is, agreed as to the main points and purposes of life? I know of no being whom I so much pity as a young woman who, believing perhaps that a reformed rake, once handsome, or it may be a wit, makes the best companion, becomes chained for life to a stupid, shiftless creature, one whose energies of body and soul are exhausted and seems unsusceptible of being renovated or restored, one, too, with whom, in that more intimate acquaintance which time and circumstances afford her, proves to be totally unworthy of her hand or her heart. 
I have said that I know of no being more pitiable than a young woman thus situated. I know of none, I mean to say, except a young man in similar circumstances. Did the effects of these unhappy companionships terminate on themselves, the misfortune would not be so great. Woman, at any rate, with a fortitude, might endure it. But it is not usually so, and here is the great evil. Misery is inflicted on a new generation, one that has done nothing to deserve it. Let me entreat my readers, therefore, while I urge them to regard the companionship of which I am now speaking as a matter of duty, to be exceedingly careful in the selection of a companion. Choose, but do not be in haste. On the wisdom of your choice much more depends than you can now possibly imagine. It is for your life. Would you could realize this truth, for though so old, and often so repeated, that it may appear rather stale, it is not less true for its age. Have nothing to do, above all, with those who despise your sex. There is a large number of young men, much larger indeed, than you may be aware, who have caught the spirit, not to say the sentiments, of Byron in regard to woman. They have caught them, I say, but this, perhaps, is not so. I will only say they have them. I know not how, as a general fact, they came by them. I can only say that they are often very early bibed, and that they grow with their growth and strengthen with their strength. Would to heaven this utter scepticism in regard to female worth and purity could be removed, or rather prevented. It is the bane of social life, as I could show were I disposed to do so by a thousand illustrations. As a general rule, to which perhaps there are some exceptions, it is according to human nature to suspect others to be wanting in those virtues which we are conscious we are wanting in ourselves. Find a person wanting in sterling integrity, and he is the very person to be found complaining of the want of it in others. I will not say that his complaints are not sometimes, indeed, quite too often, just. I only say that whether just or not, neither his suspicions nor complaints prove them to be so. Beware, then, I beseech you, beware of the young man who is ever prating about the innate worthlessness, not to say vice, of your sex. I do not say reject him forever, simply on suspicion, for that would be to go to the other extreme. But though I have admitted that there may possibly be exceptions in regard to the general rule I have laid down, I also insist that they are rare. Therefore, I again say, be wary in forming of friendships and especially so in suffering them to become more and more intimate. Precisely in these circumstances it is that you may regard immense benefit from a discreet female friend. But in this too you must be deliberate and use great judgment, for there are many whose views on these subjects are such as entirely to disqualify them for the office of an adviser. I remember hearing a lady of great gravity though of much good sense in all other respects, say that she thought the friends of a young woman were much more competent to select a companion for her than she was to make the selection for herself. I was so struck with the remark that, not knowing but I misapprehended her meaning, I ventured to inquire whether she really meant to say that other people could judge better in regard to selecting a companion for life than the parties most concerned in the choice. To which she answered, yes, without hesitation, and immediately went upon a defence of her opinion. I was as little pleased, however, with the defence as with the assertion, for the whole thing carried absurdity on the very face of it. It cannot surely be so. It is contrary to the very nature of things. I cannot help counselling you to be as wary of such an adviser as of the friend to whom she would direct your attention. The choice, the final choice, be it never forgotten, rests on you, because on you rest the responsibilities. While, therefore, you seek with great earnestness for advice, seek it as advice only. Neither seek nor admit in any case a dictator. Be it also ever remembered that it is your duty to sift with great care the opinions and views of one in whom you are daily becoming more and more deeply interested. If it be even true that woman is not distinguished for perseverance, 
let this fact only stimulate you to use what powers of perseverance you possess though you are not to be held responsible for the exercise of talents which you have not you are to account for what talents you have and fearful may be the reward of the individual who is found delinquent in the matter before us fearful in this life even were it possible to escape punishment in the life to come let a comparison then be faithfully made of your views on all important subjects as female superiority or inferiority selfishness and benevolence dress and equipage education of ourselves and others discipline its means instruments and ends household management amassing property the chief end of human existence particular duties etc while i would encourage every young woman to look forward to married life as a matter of duty i am very far from desiring to encourage that indiscriminate conversation which among young women is rather common let it be discussed by the young chiefly in the company of their parents above all let not females be found talking with great interest on this subject in the presence of the other sex such conversation in such circumstances is evil and only evil in its tendency parents may prevent this mistake in young women if they will the mother at least can prevent it when mothers manage the matter as it ought to be managed you will not find daughters on going as a company so deeply interested in these matters that nothing seems to loosen the tongue light up the countenance and brighten the eye as conversation about the latest engagements and marriages and nothing so much or so quickly interests them in a newspaper even a religious one and that too on the sabbath as the list of marriages alas do mothers or daughters know what are the practical common sense inferences from this conduct where it greatly abounds remember moreover in this matter as well as in all other matters which concern your own happiness and the happiness of others in this matter i might say which concerns your happiness more than almost all others to seek the direction of that being who has said if any like wisdom let him ask of god you cannot surely obey this first injunction on the human race without first and always at every step of your course seeking for his approbation you cannot in one word be concerned in a duty which may involve the destinies present and eternal of millions and millions of human beings without looking upward towards the throne of god and soliciting with all the humility as well as confidence of the most devoted child of an earthly parent that wisdom and guidance which are to be found in all fullness in the father of lights and which, when properly apprehended, can never mislead you. End of chapter 31